Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Julian Assange. Um, just to make a brief change, I thought I'd ask one question and then encourage you in the audience to, to do the questioning with me moderating, which seems appropriate to the source that is WikiLeaks. So, uh, welcome. If, if I can just... Yes. Uh, no press conference type questions, please. And we, we run a monthly event and we, we worship our audience here. So, we don't worship at the press conference. Welcome. Um, what has been the impact of this, of these papers? Well, can you hear me up the back? Yes. Raise your... Yes? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If I start speaking too softly, go like this. Um, the impact is too early to tell yet, um, obviously. Uh, we can see some of what the press impact is. There's something like 7,000 stories now uh, on Google News. There's responses uh, from the White House, uh, several responses from uh, Pakistan, um, from a number of different countries that have uh, found uh, material uh, in this. Um, it's clear that the, the eventual impact is going to be significant. Uh, what it is in total, I'm not sure. So the, the things that I'm most sort of optimistic about is that it is causing, if you like, significant attempts and, uh, by the White House to downplay it. On the one hand, to say we're already considering it and doing it uh, anyway. A lot of time has been taken up. So even if the words don't amount to much, uh, a lot of time is being used up in response. Now, for the, for the rest of the press, we're just starting to see that New Zealand press, the press is just extracting uh, materials from this. The Canadian press uh, says that they have just discovered that four Canadian soldiers killed in Operation Medusa in August uh, 2006 that were previously blamed on the Taliban were in fact uh, killed as a result of a US bomb uh, dropping on the house that they are in. The Danish press has started to, uh, sorry, the uh, press in the Netherlands has started uh, to find its own revelations. Uh, the press in, the pa in Pakistan um, uh, is, is really digging through this material uh, and uh, the challenge to the ISI and the former head of the ISI has come out and given public statements. Um, wh and what can we say uh, about uh, people who link it to the Pentagon Papers in 1971? Well, we have to remember that one of those people is Daniel Ellsberg, uh, the leaker of the Pentagon Papers. Uh, so he says that uh, it is the most significant thing uh, since the Pentagon Papers and perhaps more significant. Okay, so would someone like to start from the floor? We'll give you a microphone, and whilst you're waiting, I'll just ask another question. It's reported that a man who's been linked to your site before and is in jail in Kuwait, Bradley Manning, who I believe is 22, uh, it's widely reported that people who say he's a source also say he could, he could face 52 years in jail. What's your reaction to all of that? There is no charge in relation to this material and Bradley Manning. There has been no... Uh credible, I mean evidence-based allegations in relation to this material uh, and Bradley Manning, um, he is alleged to and is in fact charged uh, with being the source of the collateral murder tape which uh, showed how two Reuters journalists and between uh, 16 and 24 other people were mowed down uh, in Baghdad by an Apache helicopter in 2007. His case while I don't wish to draw on it too much because it might tend to correlate these two events, but his case uh, is important and interesting. He was a US uh, intelligence analyst based in Baghdad. Uh, he was then detained under um, the allegation that he was the source of the collateral murder video after he spoke allegedly to a journalist in the United States who betrayed him. Uh, as an alleged source of ours. Uh, he was then shipped to uh, Kuwait to be held in a military holding cell and he has been there uh, for the past six weeks. There is no reason why he should be in Kuwait. Uh, effectively, it appears that Kuwait has been used as a Guantanamo uh, for a US soldier. Uh, he is kept away from uh, inquiries by the press and he's also kept away uh, by a uh, from effective uh, civil legal representations and the civil court system uh, in the United States. Okay, so I don't know, if, can we get a microphone here? If not, could you speak up? And uh, thanks for clicking. Sorry. If you, wanted wa if you want water, we'll bring it to you. But, uh, <laughs> do, no, thank you for asking a question. Do, do give us your name so, uh, and uh, tell... My name is William Owen from Labour Valley, and I just think to put this in perspective, I think it's interesting that the Marines... Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
the Sorry, let me get your mic so bear with us. Sorry, we have, we're recording, we have to have the mic. It's interesting that the Marines... Uh, right, that's all okay, my name is William Owen from Made by Money. And I think it's interesting that the Marines who uh, were reported uh, as one of the leaks of having sprayed a number of civilians or killed a number of civilians uh, in one part of Afghanistan were given immunity from prosecution uh, as a result of, and they killed a large number of people and wounded it even more. Uh, on the one hand, they're given immunity, and on the other, uh, that uh, Bradley Wiggins in Kuwait is facing 50 years in jail. And I think that's just an interesting counterpoint. That's yeah, all I wanted and, to say. And I, I have made the statement in response to um, uh, the, the announcement the United States is going to aggressively, or is aggressively investigating uh, this leak, that the world is watching. I mean, 14 pages in The Guardian and 17 pages in Der Spiegel is not nothing. The, the world is watching to see what the US response is. Is the US response? Well, we will investigate these allegations that arise out of this material. Um, we treat them seriously. We treat uh, the rights of the Afghani people uh, seriously. We will investigate them. Uh, but in fact, the first response uh, by the US administration is that they will investi investigate uh, the person who, or persons who have uh, uncovered uh, these potential abuses. And I, I think that sends a very bad signal um, from the United States uh, to Europe and to the region of Afghanistan. Uh, hello, uh, Luke Douglas, freelance journalist. Um, let's uh, learn from the past so we can think about the future. The source for the Pentagon Papers, um, remind us what happened to him and what were the key things that made it all right for him when he was discovered, thinking with in mind the source of this leak for you. Yeah, so the, the source of the Pentagon Papers, an insider, it was Daniel Ellsberg, Daniel Ellsberg um, a former Marine, however, by the time of the Pentagon Papers, he was working as an analyst for the RAND Corporation. He did his PhD in Harvard. He was Henry Kissinger's a PhD student. He was connected, if you like, uh, into some higher parts of political society uh, within the United States. Um, Ellsberg tried for a number of years to get his revelations out uh, or, or um, to introduce reform based on his revelations. He gave these documents to uh, a handful uh, of congressmen. Uh, there was no movement um, and eventually he brokered a deal with the New York Times to get some of this material out. It hit one page, a front page on a Monday. The Times was injunctured, injuncted and he then spent efforts getting it out in other ways including eventually uh, in uh, some 5,000 pages of the material into the, the US uh, congressional record. Now Ellsberg was revealed because he spoke to his ex-wife who spoke she was okay believe it or not the ex-wife apparently didn't betray him it was the mother-in-law <laughs> <laughs> so a lesson from that be yeah be careful uh, who, you, who you speak to and if th those allegations are true that uh, Bradley Manning was um, uh, exposed because he spoke to an untrustworthy journalist instead of the people that he uh, would normally deal with, um, then that is a, in fact a, a parallel. For, how, for what happened then, um, how did Ellsberg not go to jail in the end? Um, it was quite interesting, partly because he was a deft political player, a highly intelligent man and still a highly intelligent man. Partly uh, because of a change in the zeitgeist of the United States. And also because the Nixon administration conducted an illegal investigation. It broke into his psychiatrist's office using the same fixes that broke into the Democratic Party National Convention. And so in fact these two things, of, um, breaking into Democratic Party National Convention and breaking into Ellsberg's uh, psychiatrist's office came together and eventually set off Watergate. So perhaps another lesson uh, that it it's not just the leak that it's important, it's all the events that start to flow from it, the oversteps by government in response. 
and the context at the time of the of the leak. and the zeitgeist. Yeah. Um, you're, you're next, but there's no microphone for you, so bear with me. Luke, are you happy with that answer? Yeah. And to you in the middle, please tell us who you are. Hi, I'm I'm Alexi Mostras. I work for the Times. Um, sorry to interrupt your question. This is uh, following on from the uh, Ellsberg example. I, as far as I understand it, I'm not an expert, but the New York Times in that case knew that Ellsberg was the source of the material, and that's uh, in common with uh, many uh, exposures in the traditional form of journalism. Uh, the first question is, did you, without going into any details, do you know the source of the latest leaks, uh, but are not revealing it? Uh, or is this a new model where you don't even know, WikiLeaks doesn't even know the source, uh, the identity of the source of these, uh, these leaks? Uh, we, we never know the source uh, of the leak. Um, our whole system is designed uh, such that we don't have to keep that secret. It's very, very hard uh, when, you're, uh, when your adversary is a modern uh, state intelligence agency to actually keep a secret. I would even say impossible over the long term to keep a secret anywhere other than in your head, uh, and maybe not even then, um, the way things are going. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but if you don't collect the secret in the first place, you don't have to keep it. And so our uh, communications infrastructure is designed to remove that. Sometimes we'll speak to a journalist or human rights activist um, uh, or a government figure, and they will say, hey, I might have some document for you. And we'll say, okay, don't tell us any more. Go and send it through our anonymous submission system. And we get a document that appears. Was it that person? Was it their friend? Was it a complete coincidence? Uh, we don't know. Uh, of course, we could make a guess and maybe say it has something to do with that person, uh, but it would only be a guess and it would not be evidence. Um, back here at the front, to you next after this. Can I ask you, bluntly, wouldn't you prefer to have things sent through the post? All of us in the room know we are traceable online. Anyone submitting something to you of the significance of the leak we're currently dealing yeah. with, clearly, th it's so traceable that you might as well send your name to you if you go online, I would imagine. No. Uh, in fact, that is not true. But uh, we do encourage people to send things in the post. So the, not post, the post is still a fairly effective. Uh, the, the problem <coughs> is, well, to begin with, our online submission is, not, is like nothing else uh, that you've seen. I mean, uh, we encrypt all the information. It, it is routed through uh, protective legal jurisdictions, multiple servers. We then also interface with another system that was developed by US Navy intelligence to conceal uh, the locations of Navy intelligence officers. So really, this is like nothing else uh, on Earth. Uh, and it's a very technical answer, and coming to you, but it's still interesting to all of us in the room that you still like the post, absolutely. Given yeah. that you're a very media, you know, modern media side, and everyone in the room is. Sorry, to you. We're we're, we're waiting for you. Uh, Shazadi Beg, I'm a lawyer. Um, I've got a, a question and a comment. My question is that it seems to me that what has been printed yesterday falls into two categories. You have the first category, which is the war logs, which tells us about incidents that have taken place on a daily basis since 2004. Then you have the, the second limb of it, which is an intelligence assessment. And my question is, how reliable do you see those intelligence assessments, bearing in mind that they have come from a number of different sources, some of which have been dubious sources, for, for all the reasons that we read in The Guardian yesterday? Um, my, my comment is that, flowing from that, it seems to me that there are two issues now under the spotlight. One is the killing of innocent people and the legal consequences that flow from that. And the second, which actually hasn't been referred to in any of the press, but it's of some concern to me, is that there are extrajudicial killings going on both in Afghanistan and in Pakistan for the simple reason that you do not have effective criminal justice systems in, in place in either of those countries. I have spent a lot of my time interviewing militants on the AFPAC border, and I can tell you that a lot of the information that I read yesterday rings true. Would you remind us of your question? Um, the, qu the question was, what do you make of the intelligence assessments and the reliability? Yeah, yeah. So you said there was two categories. There's the sort of factual reporting, although it would be generous to say that it is factual reporting, but the, the reporting of US military units 
conducted an attack at a certain time, used this particular type of equipment in this particular location. At the end, there was this many people dead, and they say this is what we did, and they say that there are a certain number of civilians, and they say that there are a certain number of insurgents. That saying is often a bit erroneous, but the times, the dates, locations, pretty factual. Um, then there is some in reports by informers, and then there is some analysis uh, of that material. Analysis by the embassies, analysis by m Marines Intelligence and others. So it's, it's the reports by informers uh, that you cannot take at face value. Now, where the informer reports have gone through m Marines Intelligence, G2, uh, and some of the other intelligence units, they do have a rating for the reliability of the source. I don't know if any of your, any people here have ratings for their sources. It might be something interesting if you're swapping sources from one person to another, what their rating is. So you can say, okay, that Marines believes that this informer was a good informer or a bad informer. It depends um, on whose informer he was, doesn't it? And the nationality and the ethnic origin. No, well, they, they have a rating system. Now, I don't for a, m a minute say that this rating system is accurate, but nonetheless, it is true that they, at that particular time, uh, said that that was the rating uh, for that particular informer. Now you can see many cases where the, the information from the informers is just ridiculous. I mean completely outlandish because Osama bin Laden is, is meeting once a month with a whole bunch of people and having a cup of tea in a meeting in Afghanistan. I mean it's just on, a, on the same date at a particular tea house. I mean it, it is completely outlandish and some of the reports from informers will also say that um, this source took money. He was a paid informant and he was paid money. So that's another reason. If, if you're in Afghanistan and you walk up to a US soldier and you say, I know the location of an Al-Qaeda operative or senior commander of the Taliban, I will tell it to you if you give me $200. What soldier is going to be the one that said no? But to, to, in general terms, some of, the, some of the stuff on this latest leaks is rubbish and some of it is good. And the, uh, the idea is which? And you're a lawyer, and that's how you spend your time as well, isn't it? So can you, would you like to be you next, and will you introduce yourself? Uh, Joel Gunter, journalism.co.uk. Can I ask, given the obvious advantages of working with national newspapers on a leak of this size, do you foresee that becoming the kind of default uh, model? Wait, wait, uh, there's a, a presumption in your question that I'm not sure is borne out. Keep okay. the microphone. <laughs> I'm not sure it's obvious, the advantage, but go on. Well... I think it's safe to say there are advantages in terms of distribution and manpower and a certain amount of credibility in terms of a release like this. And I'm curious whether you foresee that becoming a model which WikiLeaks will use more and more in the future. And if so, will you turn to the same newspapers, do you think? Different newspapers or possibly different types of media organisations altogether? Yeah. Well, we have done this in the past. Uh, we've done this for a long time with individual journalists. Uh, what we haven't done before is build a coalition uh, of really very impressive, uh, well one can argue about them, but impressive press organisations and kept them all together and working happily together, which was a difficult thing to do. Um, but it did bring uh, a lot of resources to bear and you can see in the spread in The Guardian that they really uh, did throw their weight uh, into, into putting us into a form where the public could digest it pretty quickly. Um, so yes, we will do more of that um, as we are familiar and, and happy with the outcomes uh, from different organisations. We will of course uh, turn to the ones that we foresee are going to invest um, resources in our material and, and treat it seriously. Some, an interesting thing I observed from this and, and in fact the, the, our other media partners observed was that by having us and more than one media organisation involved, we all kept each other honest. If we only had one media organisation and us involved, then we'd have mainly one group writing the stories. But we had, even though we would release still the full data, we'd only have one sort of major attack on the story end. And that would then permit that organisation to express its innate biases to look at the material in a particular way, to, to just pick the cherries that it was interested in. But by having these three organisations, each pro approach from a slightly different angle, uh, I think we've 
manage to get a much richer uh, result at the end. And then we also have all our primary source material uh, that we've released uh, to the public. And this, could you kindly follow up on it? Because downstairs people are asking this question a lot. Do you yourself see this as a new journalism? Or is it just for you a sign of how much material there was after nine years of war, 90,000 documents? Would you tell us how you see it and tell us if you're happy with the answer you've received? Um, happy with the answer I've received, yes. And I do see it, uh, I think there's a lot of speculation about the pos possibility for a new type of journalism to emerge. Um, people have been talking today about the possibility of national news organisations like the ones that you've worked with. Um, becoming organisations that rather than source material themselves, add value to source material that will come more and more in the future to more independent organisations such as WikiLeaks. And what I'd also be interested to ask is, do you foresee the success and the sheer volume of coverage of this particular leak, uh, bringing up more institutions such as WikiLeaks and bringing a kind of mutualised journalism into place in which those organisations work in tandem with news organisations? Yeah, I hope so. I mean, when, whenever you have a, a bigger, more flexible economy, you end up with uh, players that specialise in particular areas. We specialise in protecting sources and we specialise in publishing material uh, that will be attacked legally and politically. And so we specialise in the defence of that attack. Um, just like, to some degree, a press organisation might hire outside lawyers to deal with a particular case because those lawyers are specialists uh, in, in dealing with, with that type of legal problem. Um, and you can ask questions of this audience as well, you know, in a moment, because it's not a news conference, remember. <laughs> but you're next, then you, and then Julian, I'll ask you a question if, we, if you've got anything for our audience, because yeah. you've asked people a couple I of will, times. I will, I yeah. will. Hi there, I'm Sarah Williams of Made by Many. Um, my question follows on on the previous one, which is about what is the changing role for the press? And um, John Owen of this club said on Twitter, I think it was this morning, the journalists at the three papers to, to which you release these files had done an exceptional job of interpreting that content. And I think previously we've relied on the press to source information and then to interpret it and provide commentary. And in this case, the sourcing was done for them. So do you see this being kind of a watershed moment for the role of the press? Do you see things changing for the press? Or do you think there's still a future for independent investigative journalism? I, I'm not sure that there's an or uh, in that equation. So you think that they could coexist yeah. happily enough? I, d I, don't, I don't see an, an or in that e equation. Uh, what I do see is when there are multiple avenues to get things out, and when there's an organization like WikiLeaks saying, uh, we're going to publish it all, at a particular date, uh, that keeps people honest. Now, to you in the red shirt. Hi, my name is John D. McHugh. I'm a photographer and filmmaker, and I've worked a lot in Afghanistan over the last few years. Um, I'm fascinated by these war logs. Um, I had the dubious pleasure this morning of reading about the day that I got shot in a six-hour gunfight in Afghanistan, where 18 soldiers were killed, 11 more were wounded. It was about six hours. There were two airstrikes. Um, there was a lot of damage done, and the report is what was the nine, date? 14th of May, 2007. And the, um, the report is nine or ten sentences long. It's, it's absolutely bizarre. Um, but I've heard a lot of accusations already um, directed towards you about the military are very protective of their TTPs, their tactics, techniques, yeah. and protocol. And <coughs> accusations have been leveled at you saying that this is going to give away you know, huge amounts of information about how the military operate. I've always had to be very careful not to report lots of stuff like that. But that six hour gunfight is nine sentences. So what do you think you've given away? How much do you think you, do you believe that you've undermined the TTPs, the, the way that operate? How much jeopardy do you believe that you have put the, the soldiers on the ground in by releasing this? Well, your, your question uh, has hidden within it uh, that those soldiers should not be put in jeopardy. Is, is that what you believe? No, 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 not at all. I, I, okay, I'll tell you. What I believe, I don't really believe that it's uh, very much been put in jeopardy at all. I don't think there's very much information. Yeah, I'm going I understand to answer. I'm just, just yeah. you know. But, I, but I'm interested in, in, in what you think, because this accusation is being leveled at yeah. you, not me. Well, you know, of course it's nonsense. There, there's an, an attempt, uh, as we often see with the material we publish, to try and not deal directly 
uh, with the allegations, but try and side around it and attack it from a different, a different position. Um, this material doesn't release uh, TTPs in any easily readable way. I mean, if, if an academic spent a lot of time going through all this material, maybe they could pull something out. But that said, they don't need to go to this. Uh, we have released the TTPs. We release these TTP manuals all the time. Uh, we release uh, the US Special Forces TTP manual for southern Afghanistan, it's 2006. We released the US Special Forces um, manual on unconventional warfare for se dated September 2008, current US military policy on how to work through proxies in various countries, typically coming out of the South American experience, to overthrow uh, those governments, um, including specific instructions on uh, violating the Geneva Convention uh, by putting on uh, the enemy's uniform when uh, behind lions. Um, you know, you should read that. It, it, it reads like the evil Noam Chomsky. Um, I'm serious. Sp special for look it up. Special Forces Manual on Unconventional Warfare, where it's defined as working through surrogates. So the Contras are the classic example. So we put out that stuff all the time. Um, not just us, some other websites do as well. Publicintelligence.net, uh, Cryptome uh, does occasionally. Um, these things are often accidentally revealed on US military websites. Now, I'm um, coming to a question at the back. Um, I'd like to call some questions for people who do question Julian's ethics. If you're in the room, obviously it's an important part of our discussion. People have asked about procedure so far, so do feel that you can criticize this man if you're in the room. Um, but I did promise you that it's not a news conference. Here you see young people making their career in journalism at the beginning and other old, washed up old things. Uh, you know, uh, do you have a question for the room to prove to you that it's not a news conference? You've been here living in London during the time, I believe if you go to the US you were arrested? Is it, uh, maybe not straight away? That's what I'm told. All right, so here you are in London at the time of the biggest release for the site. You can have a question to the audience and then you at the back can have one back to him. And critics, please make yourself known. So I, I have a very sort of specific procedural question, uh, which is how many people here, I'm trying not to, to bias the answer, but how many people here tomorrow are going to spend time working uh, on that raw data? Okay. And so that's a, a minority, maybe a fifth or a sixth uh, of the hand. So I'd be interested to know uh, why the rest of you are not going to work on that raw data. Uh, do, you mean, do you mean working as in working going through it? Well, re reality. spending time, significant, serious time, not just but idle time, I, serious time to go through but it. This is a fair point. Can't a member of the public have serious time? Or is it just journalists, as described no. in the old way, who have serious time? I think that's what his point he's well, making. Well, journalists are paid to spend their time that but way. But as, as a good citizen, he can have serious time reading Absolutely, it. absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but good citizens tend to be busy with other things. That's my experience. But, so we know that's in Julian, Julian Assange's mind. So as you then ask future questions, will you make us know which camp you're in so that he's interested in that? So let him know if you're working on it, if you're not working on it. And can I go to you at the back? Please, please introduce yourself. To give it a go, because there are people who might be watching on the internet. We'll give you another one. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Oshin McCourt. I don't. I'm not a journalist. I actually work in the city. Um, my question is: I heard Paddy Ashdown recently talk about black pools, and what he means by black pools are holes in regulatory systems, holes in legal systems, where things have expanded into those gaps to do something different and do something new. You mentioned Kuwait. You've talked about Guantanamo Bay. What seems like a long time ago now, I heard a human rights lawyer who, who'd, who'd been to Guantanamo Bay who talked about how the American government was exploiting that space that was a physical space outside of their regulatory, their legal system, to do what they wanted to do. And in a certain sort of way, WikiLeaks is doing exactly the same thing. You're using a space that isn't currently no. particularly... No, well, let me, no let's finish in a second. No. Which isn't effectively controlled by the people who want to control it in a different way or want to stop you doing what yeah. you're doing. And my question is, how are you going to respond to that? What, uh, what attacks on how you operate as a, an entity uh, do you anticipate coming and, and what are your defences going to be? Okay, uh, so this question is very interesting. Um, 
In relation to Guantanamo Bay, we have had some interesting observations. So we leaked the main manuals for Guantanamo Bay. On the other hand, uh, I've been involved in leaking information, publishing information leaked from, uh, say, the Cayman Islands, where we had a very big uh, court case in 2008 when we were sued by uh, the biggest private Swiss bank. So in the Cayman Islands, people launder money. They launder it through that secrecy jurisdiction. It doesn't have the sort of um, accountability that we would expect in the UK or in many other countries. Similarly, the United States military laundered people to Guantanamo Bay and hid people in Guantanamo Bay, laundered them also through uh, an unregulated section of Poland and several other countries in Europe where people were pushed uh, for rendition purposes. And now, arguably, that's also happened uh, to Bradley Manning, who is in Kuwait, hidden from effective uh, civil representation. As far as we are concerned, uh, we don't operate out of Guantanamo Bay. We don't operate out of Cayman Islands. In fact, all our people are in... Um, all, all our servers are in relatively developed countries because that's the only place where uh, internet connectivity is cheap. Uh, and we have been attacked uh, in the legal system a number of times and threatened to be attacked over a hundred times. Uh, and we have won all of those cases. So we, we are not yet at the position where we are sort of actively trying to defy uh, the rule of law or going to a, a country which really does have no law at all uh, on the books. Uh, the, the only thing that um, uh, sort of, I guess, long-term uh, project that uh, we, are, we are involved in and, and trying to um, promote uh, is in Iceland uh, to um, promote the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative, which pulls in uh, protective, uh, successful legislation from uh, Sweden and from New York and from Belgium and other countries. Uh, that have proven to be uh, a boon for investigative journalists uh, or publishers. Uh, so pushing for positive legal reforms uh, at the same time that uh, other powerful groups are trying to water down uh, constitutional and other protections for publishers. Um, I'd like to take some critical questions and uh, I'll tee one up and then we'll go back. And Julian Assange has agreed to show you code on the website so we won't run this session uh, continuously. So please do make yourself known. Um, you yourself kept back 20,000 lines of this, you know, 15,000. 15, and that tells me logically if, uh, that you, you knew there are concerns, security concerns or further traceability concerns. So there is a wider ethical question with troops from this country and other country in the line of fire. What is your responsibility to them, just as you have a responsibility to a, a, an idea of the truth? What is, your idea, what is it to 20-year-old British boys yeah. who give their lives? What's your responsibility to them? Well, I don't know about giving the lives. I, I don't see... Well, if they die, they've given their lives. Yeah, to what? Well, th we know what they think, but, but just can you tell us what you think? What's your responsibility? Well, you know, I, Einstein had a quote about men whose spines are controlled by someone else, and it wasn't very flattering. Uh, but we are concerned with human beings' lives, conscripts, and other troops are human beings. Uh, we are an organization that tries to promote justice, so to that extent, uh, we are concerned also uh, with the lives of uh, combatants uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a region. Um, we held back 15,000 reports, uh, not because we viewed uh, that they would be of any uh, threat to uh, Western forces in uh, Afghanistan, uh, but rather because some of them, a very, very few number, uh, mentioned the names of local Afghanis uh, that might have been subject to retribution. We're not sure yet, uh, but we decided to pause uh, to study that issue further. I don't want this to be an interview, so I'm going to take more questions from the floor. That may have not been a full answer to my question. You can decide. You're the audience. And you can ask others, but your turn's next. Hi, I'm Dinesh Suratani. I'm a lawyer practicing in London. Um, following on from that, um, one of the questions that I had was... Um, I, can't, I can't see you. Sorry, I'm right here. Um, what, I mean, 
how do you decide the criteria um, for what to withhold and what not to withhold? Why do you have the right to decide those criteria? And how ha who have you retained to actually be involved in applying the criteria on a case-by-case -case basis? Because there must be some such thing as a legitimate national security concern. Uh, we are not a national organization. Uh, it is not our role to play sides uh, for states. States have national security concerns. We do not have national security concerns. We have concerns about human beings and whether human beings <coughs> can be affected. Um, presently, we often hear the statement uh, that something may be a threat to US national security. And this, is, this must be shot down uh, whenever this statement is made. A threat to US national security? Is anyone serious? The, the security of the entire nation of the United States, it is ridiculous. If we are talking about a threat to individual soldiers or individual commands, uh, or the citizens in particular places of the United States, then that is potentially a genuine concern. But to, to, to continually throw up this specter of national security, uh, what is meant intrinsically under this sort of statement is that it will simply be opposed by the national security state, by all those people involved in that whole sector don't like it. That's all that is meant. So we should be precise uh, in the words that we choose. So what is your more precise question? Well, notwithstanding that some people might abuse the notion of national security concern, that doesn't necessarily mean that such a concern doesn't exist. So I suppose you could take well, the position... People can be concerned about all things. We're concerned about individual people's lives. So if your question is, how do we go about making sure innocents are not harmed, then that's a question I can answer. No, but there's a policy decision that one makes when one publishes this, and that policy decision is that freedom of information... We have policies in relation to doing justice. We are an organisation that uses a meth method of transparency to try and bring about greater justice. It has worked quite well over the past four years. No one, as far as we know or has ever been alleged, has come to harm. We have a harm minimisation policy <coughs> for those rare cases where information might reasonably cause innocence to come to harm. We apply that policy, which is a policy, not an ad hoc ed editorial decision. Uh, and so far, that policy has worked. That policy is part of what has fed in to the uh, withholding of these 15,000 documents for greater review. And okay. what's the expertise of the people who apply that policy? Well, we have read more leaked documents than any other organisation that's not a spy, spy organisation on earth. If someone can apply that policy, uh, surely we can do it. In fact, uh, I am, I, it's hard for me to think of another organisation that could, in fact, apply that policy as well. We, in the end, we are immediately accountable uh, to the general public. Uh, we are immediately accountable to our sources. The general public funds us from week to week. We are immediately accountable in a financial sense. We are not funded by advertisers. We are not funded by large shareholders. We are not funded uh, by foundations that might be accountable. We are immediately, a public, immediately accountable to the general public uh, for our actions. And we are also immediately accountable to our sources. If the sources do not support uh, our behaviour, which is evidenced by what we publish every day, then our role as an organisation disappears immediately. Okay, and um, more, more question over here on the right. Would you introduce yourself? Uh, Kat Brown from The Times. Um, I'm one of the majority of people in this room who won't be reporting on this tomorrow or investigating it. That's not because I'm not interested, it's because my day job is writing about film, television and technology. However, it's also not to say that I'm not interested and I would very much appreciate your advice for people like me and other good citizens in this room who would like to go through raw data but who, I, I've never done this before, I don't know, I simply don't know where to begin. I mean, is it a question of start at the very beginning or do you jump into a page that you like the look of? Just if you had some advice on what we could do, yeah. might not well, be we, serious. I will give that a bit later. but. Yeah. Um, your point raises a, a broader question, which we understood immediately uh, when we were trying to get this gig up, uh, that it's not that the public doesn't want to read 
investigative journalism. It's rather that the per word cost of investigative journalism is much higher than other forms of journalism and much, much higher than subsidised journalism, subsidised through press releases or people trying to push their barrow by giving free interviews, etc. If the cost per word of investigative journalism is brought down to be more competitive with the cost per words of other forms of journalism, then there will be more words of investigative journalism published uh, in newspapers. And thank you for your question. That's the second part of what uh, Julian Assange has agreed to do, is go over there with his laptop and well, it's not yours. I hear you don't have a laptop, but maybe the Guardian, I think, says you don't have a laptop for reasons of traceability. <laughs> um, thank you very much for keeping these questions going. And so there will be time to see him at work. And as I say, if you want the general questions, please ask them before we move on. But to yourself there. Hi, uh, my name is Dorothy Parvaz. I'm a freelance journalist, which might make me a bad citizen. I'm not sure. But the question I have is this. Um, so this is a lot of data that you dumped out there, for lack of a better word. And, you know, three, organ three news organizations, that's a great start. But for the average person, this is daunting. Was there any thought as to, you know, maybe parsing this out? Parsing this out? Not, and I'm not saying this as a journalist, because I don't want the average person to rely on journalists to, as a starting point, certainly, to what's going on and what, what, they, what information they need access to. But because even three news organizations can spin a person pretty well. And there's more information there that you can find from than that could you know, there's more stories in this three so perspectives. You're, so you're asking why didn't we just go bang to everyone? No, 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 no. Actually I'm asking quite the opposite. What did you consider perhaps s more slowly releasing smaller chunks of this data? Just even to the three three news organizations, because as as you uh, release smaller chunks, perhaps the average citizen, the good citizen, would have would be less daunted by this even now, even without just your average daily paper yeah. online is sometimes too much for the average reader. Yeah, ju just too hard to do logistically, um, to, to, do, to make all those sort of uh, negotiations with whom, who do you trust. Uh, would uh, all those big organizations be happy to have little organizations involved? What if someone publishes first, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that we simply didn't have the logistical capability to structure uh, that kind of arrangement. Okay, and to you uh, with the blonde hair, and then would you pass the microphone to the woman in front of you afterwards? Yeah, hi, um, Amy Willis, Telegraph. Um, I wanted to find out why um, you approached The Guardian in the UK and not anybody else. <laughs> uh, the Guardian had done uh, excellent work with our material before. Um, so I viewed, that, I viewed that they would continue to do that work uh, and we received certain assurances um, that they would, and those assurances a appear to have been accurate. And do you think in the future that you're going to be um, approaching other newspapers as well as The Guardian? <laughs> um, it's a question, it's allowed. Uh, <laughs> if they have expertise uh, in a particular area and a proven, proven track record, um, uh, and there's an individual that we can trust at an individual level uh, within that organization and the, uh, we can see that the uh, editor is also on board. Um, yes. And, and pass it in front of you. Hi, I'm Heidi from a Danish paper, Jyllandsposten. I just wanted to ask what your personally, personal uh, motivation is and what is it that you're going to be arrested for if you go to the US? <laughs> hmm. I see today the White House put out a, a briefing to uh, uh, reporters, a second briefing to reporters, um, private briefing to reporters about WikiLeaks uh, and me. Uh, and it quoted a section from a, a profile interview with me in Der Spiegel uh, saying that uh, I enjoy crushing bastards. So, yeah, that is part of my motivation. I'm a combative person and I like um, uh, stopping people who have created victims from creating any more. Uh, somehow the White House finds that offensive. I don't know why. It seems bizarre of all the things that they could pick on me for, that they've, they've picked on that one. Um, uh, in relation to going to the United States, um, 
I'm not sure. The, 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 the legal advice is uh, that it one, uh, sorry, that our, our sources advice uh, from with inside um, the US government is that there were thoughts uh, being given as to whether I could be charged as a co-conspirator uh, for espionage, which is serious. Um, that doesn't seem to be the thinking within the United States uh, anymore, um, I hope, and as far as we're aware. Uh, however, there is also another possibility of being detained uh, as a material witness um, and being kept uh, in either in confinement or not being allowed to leave the country uh, until, um, presumably this is in relation to the Manning case, uh, until that uh, Manning case uh, is concluded. And are you a geek? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not your critic, I'm just another journalist uh, from Russian media, actually. Do you have a name? Uh, Elena, sorry. Right. Uh, uh, so, but your critics, they're very curious. Why you don't pub... Sorry. Why you don't publish materials on, let's say, on Putin? Or maybe on some... You know, communist criminal acts? And well, in fact, we, we have published the secret state censorship list of CCTV from China, the secret state censorship list of Badu, uh, the Google equivalent. Uh, we are censored in China. If you go to Badu and you search in Chinese, uh, set your character set to Chinese and search for WikiLeaks.org, your connection will reset and you won't be able to search for anything for 20 minutes. Um, so, uh, no, we have enemies everywhere, don't worry. Mm. <laughs> but uh, that's a fair point, isn't it? Pick on some on your own sides, because, you know, China, they're quite happy to execute criminals, and in the United States, you may be arrested as a material witness. It's a sort of free world point that's being raised there, and uh, many people would agree. The United States does execute people. Right, but not for, uh, not for hacking. No. Not yet. <laughs> but please uh, contribute, but, uh, please. Brenda Griffiths, BBC Arabic News. I'm interested to know, um, do you feel that these, uh, these leaks will turn the tide of public opinion and political policy in Afghanistan as the Pentagon Papers did on the Vietnam War and ended that conflict? The Pentagon Papers turned elite opinion, uh, changed some elite opinion. Um, it is wrong to say that they changed popular opinion. Um, of course, elite opinion has a, a, a habit of trickling down to sometimes be popular opinion. Sometimes it's the other way. Um, I think to some degree we have seen that policy changed in the Vietnam War and we try and weave a story uh, as to explain why. There may have been, in fact, many reasons uh, for that. But it does seem that this particular leak has come at an interesting historical juncture uh, where there was a mood already in a number of nations to change policy about Afghanistan. Uh, so uh, hopefully this material uh, will be enough uh, to sort of just push that over the edge um, and lead to some concrete efforts to not continue uh, the war in the same way that it's been going for the last nine years. Um, hi, Leah McLaren from the Globe and Mail. Um, broadly speaking, it seems to me there are kind of two, two prongs to this story. On the one hand, there's the war logs, obviously the, the core of the story. But on the other hand, there is this massive process piece about WikiLeaks and also the rise of you over the past few you know, weeks as a celebrity. And what I want to ask is, are you concerned about distracting from your own story? And what is your, I presume you have some kind of strategy. Why are you putting yourself yeah. out, out there like this now? Yeah, well, we started off um, like The Economist, uh, except even our board wasn't named. Um, unfortunately, that produced extraordinary, because we wanted, our, we wanted to make the news, not to be the news, but that produced extraordinary curiosity uh, into who we were and who was behind things. So this, this attempt to not be the news, in fact, made us the news. Um, and as such, we realised we had to have someone uh, coming forward and speaking. 
The other, the other aspect of that is we encourage whistleblowers to step forward and take risks under the basis that there are also compensating uh, opportunities for getting what they want, for getting some kind of reform or justice up. Uh, and um, by us not by us not publicly putting a person forward, um, it had the sort of appearance that we were too scared uh, to um, step forward. And how could we possibly ask uh, confidential sources who were at risk of imprisonment uh, to step forward if we weren't willing to publicly uh, step forward ourselves? Now, that doesn't mean that everyone uh, in our organisation uh, has to take those risks. I am the person who takes that risk, and as a result, I get a lot of unfair credit, uh, but I also get all the criticism. Um, can I ask you, if we have 40 minutes remaining, would you like some more questions uh, from all of you? Uh, or are you interested in seeing um, Julian Assange at the Keys? So uh, would you, if you'd like the questions to go on, shall we say for 10 minutes of that 30 minutes, could you raise your hands? So that's 10 more minutes of questions. You're next. And then we'll, will that be all right for you? We'll go to the boards. Yes, so to you. I'm Philip Robinson, BBC. Um, I work with Afghan stories, so some of the stuff that I read for the last couple of days uh, was not that surprising for me. Um, some of it is, is a bit predictable, things to do with uh, Pakistan, with civilian casualties. Some of it is very interesting, very new, needs to be investigated further. But what really surprised me, and I'm still battling with, with the answer, is that how all this incredible amount of information could be collated by one person or, or few persons without being detected and uh, passed on to you. And how do you guard against being manipulated by a person or persons or groups of people? Um, and how, how could it just happen that uh, you know, this amount of material um, could just uh, be put together and, and passed on to you? Yeah, so I have no comment on the first part of that question uh, other than to say that um, as uh, the, sp the speed and capacity of computers has increased, um, of course it's easier to, to, to move great, you know, you move enormous amounts of information around. I mean, I have a USB stick in my pocket that can uh, hold uh, all the White House emails. It doesn't actually have all the White House emails on it. <laughs> Maybe it will one day. Um, in relation to manipulation, uh, well, I mean, just like anything else, I mean, any of us is subject to, to manipulation and you just check for internal uh, consistency, external consistency, uh, and then if you can't get enough from doing that, uh, you reach out to people who know more and get them uh, to look at it or comment on it uh, or to admit it. And just coming to you, but just picking up on that, yes. would you Sorry. agree that actually if you had anything secret to say at all in your life, you should never say it by email? Yes. Yeah. Uh, no, no. That's not true, actually. Um, that's not true at all. It depends on your threat model. So all the time we have to balance uh, the costs of security, which can be extremely high and very onerous for those people who have tried to call me up and have not been able to because I don't carry a phone around with a fixed number. Um, the costs of security uh, versus the benefits of security. Uh, and when you're dealing with high-tech spy agencies of, from China or Russia or the UK uh, or the United States, of course your, your threat model is one that's extremely aggressive and you cannot send emails about the subject under those, under those circumstances. If that is not your threat model, which it isn't even for us most of the time, some of the times it is, but not most of the time, uh, then actually you, you should do what is fast because doing something fast is also uh, affords a degree of pr uh, protection in not giving your mm -hmm. opponents enough time to predict uh, what you're going to do. But it aids traceability, <coughs> because our friend here, who has access to X material, answer five people. And so when things are grouped together on computers, P 
people who run the security systems in all big organizations know who has access. Yeah. You, don't, you don't want your source sending you an email from their regular account inside uh, any uh, even moderate size organization. Yeah, if I heard of BBC Arabic, it's again about the volume of the report. Um, some people say that it, it is so enormous that it will fail to grab people's imagination as Abu Ghraib pictures did. Please use the microphone. As Abu Ghraib pictures did. Would you consider this in future when you have other reports and to release it in sort of shorter? In this particular case, the reports all have um, standardized data on top. The standardized data is location of the incident in the report, uh, often down to 10 meters because soldiers carry around these GPS units. It includes standardized time reporting. It includes standardized reporting about fields for a number of wounded, killed, detained on all sides and the host nation. Um, so that means certain types of statistical analyses come out of this very rapidly. For instance, we just added up all the kills from all these individual reports for Afghanistan. Uh, and that is the raw statistical information, the raw basis for the raw statistical uh, data that the Pentagon uses for its own uh, figures. Once you understand the structure of these reports, understanding the next one is a lot easier and a lot faster. Uh, so that means that there's a synergistic effect between all this material uh, and for that reason it, it would not be right to release it in a piecemeal way, way because there's global analysis that can be done on this. You saw in The Guardian the, the sort of animation of the IEDs going off, uh, 16,000 IEDs and where they were uh, over the past six years. That's something that's come out of this data uh, with a computer program like that. Um, and that is because it's all there at once. Um, yeah, we're winding down this, this element of the room for now. Not you, sir. Sorry, you with the glasses have the microphone. And then you Thanks. at the front have been ignored for the last 20 minutes. Um, I can imagine it must be, you know, quite easy. Would you easy. introduce yourself? Oh, sorry, yes. Yeah, Tim Melbourne from Made by Many. Um, I can imagine it must be quite easy to get carried away with all the responsibility and almost to get drunk on the power that you have uh, to influence things. How do you keep your feet on the ground? That's a good question. I guess I'm finding out. Um, in the end, we don't leak anything. It is our sources that have faith and trust in us based on our behavior uh, that give material to us, um, based on our behavior and reputation. Do you ever get kind of self-doubt with all of that responsibility? It's an, it's an enormous responsibility. I mean, the other side of that is self-love. I mean, do you see yourself... Do you see yourself I was as, getting to that. Sorry. You but take, you said it better. Take it away. Take it away. No, I, I guess, you know, there's, it, it must be quite weird becoming a celebrity. Do you feel like a hero? No. Um, it's actually not that weird. I mean... Uh, it's... Well, it's a bit boring, actually. No, I'm serious. I mean, actually, I like giving talks, but doing interviews is pretty boring. Um, uh, in relation to heroism, there's a, a model for what, I, uh, for what I do and how I think about the world. And this model is um, my journalistic friends in Kenya. And when they have a hot story and they're about to publish, uh, and they have had serious consequences in the past, like the standard newspaper being raided by police and everyone put in prison, um, is that they file and they go to Tanzania and they see what happens the next day when the thing is published and what happens the next day. And then at some time they understand the political situation, they come back. Or if they think they already understand the political situation well enough, they stay in the country and they file and okay, you go to prison for half a day maybe, if you understand it well. Uh, well, that's just something you put on your CV, right? I think you're a hero, but I think most heroes are quite mad. <laughs> do, you, do you think you should, someone should buy him a white cat? 
you know, been to stroke. I, I don't see him as a... No, that's more of a Bond villain, isn't but, it? But because you are a villain to some, I mean, and um, your question next, but you have been described as paranoid and that, you know, you're telling us you don't carry a computer and your phone, you don't live anywhere. I mean, were you like that when you were 16? What, you know, or, you bec you, or have you become it as a result of the, of the weight of, um, of controversy well, of the I, material? I mean, it's, it's tough. I think people will see in retrospect that these accusations by um, uh, tabloid press uh, well, something just, there's this new phenomenon this thing is just above tabloid press but still not credible what do you call that like mother jones what's that well it's commentary isn't it it's, it's like we, the new yorker that tabloid <laughs> yeah well that actually can go a bit that way when it's writing profiles but um anyway there's that there's that type of press which has said you know, based upon our security procedures, I'm proud of it. It's just ridiculous. I mean, we're in a serious business. Um, we have had serious incidences, uh, very serious incidences in Africa. Um, we have serious sources, we have serious uh, intelligence investigation, and we occasionally have serious spying on us. Uh, it is not a matter of paranoia, it's simply a matter of doing your job properly. Um, if I wasn't concerned about the sort of integrity of the computer systems and telephone systems I'm using to communicate, um, I should be shot because I would not be doing my job properly. To you here in the front who've been ignored. Oh, thanks. <laughs> my name is Sarah Lafferty. I'm just a private citizen with an interest and an open mind at this stage. I haven't really formed an opinion and I'm really just learning about WikiLeaks recently. Um, I wanted to go back to the Danish lady's question because she asked you a two-part question and the part about your personal motivation, I haven't really understood how um, you've talked a, a, a lot about some of the practical reasons why you're doing this. I just, when you talked about um, the, 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 the idea of crushing bastards, I think that was probably said a little bit tongue-in-cheek but maybe not and um, no, it wasn't said so no I th the reason well the reason that I would would like WikiLeaks is because I would be interested in a peaceful outcome and this is quite hostile to me so that that disappointed me a little I, I wasn't as disappointed for the reasons that the US government probably was I uh, I was originally thinking that your motivation was to create some kind of peaceful outcome, and that seemed quite aggressive to me. No, uh, the, you know, the Lady Justice has a scale in one hand and a sword in the other, um, and that is what justice is like. It, it, it cannot be done through, if you like, peaceful, peaceful means alone, uh, otherwise the most combative person in the room just completely takes over. Okay, pause there. Um, the way it was agreed was that um, we would have this session and it may not have answered everything that sh we should have answered but I think we've tried as hard as we can so thank you for taking these questions and uh, I hope you agree it's not a news conference um, but well you know there you are um, you agreed to, sh to go through the system so open-minded people would know this is Julian Assange's own demonstration it's not an independent an, an assessment of his work or his site He's going to show you what he thinks, and you, you're going to need to make up your mind. There's no one here to say it's the truth or whatever, but he agreed to show you in answer to your questions. And then, um, I don't know how you wish to run that. I'm not involved, but if you feel people should shout out at you, yeah. perhaps you'll take advice from others in the room, but um, please go over there and, uh, and have a look. But for now, well done. Well, assuming it's up, you know, it's had a lot of traffic recently. <laughs> um, this is Charlotte, who, who can be your magician's assistant. Okay. And so why, why I'm setting this up, um, uh, who here has seen uh, Collateral Murder, this uh, video we released about Baghdad? Okay. So I, I'm pleased that um, a good friend of mine, Kristen, uh, who was one of the Icelandic journalists uh, who went to Baghdad uh, to Alamin to research this story um, is here with me uh, in the in the front row. Um, uh, just uh, did not have his contract renewed at RUV in case you're looking for an extremely capable person. Um, and uh, so why I'm doing this setup? Uh, perhaps he can tell you a little bit about what it was like uh, getting into Baghdad 
uh, <coughs> during that period because it's quite a, an interesting uh, journalistic story um, and how he uh, and uh, our fixer and um, another colleague uh, tracked down um, the children uh, who were in that van uh, and their family. Okay. I'm going to take this one off. Well, hi.